First of all, we'd like to express our joy at the fact that you have come to this place in this way, meaning that you have come here in order to study the principles of Buddhism and to train yourself in meditation. We are pleased by two kinds of benefits which should come from this. First of all, you will all personally benefit from this study and training. And then second, this will be of use in developing the human world towards peace and happiness. So we all ought to be pleased by these two kinds of benefits which ought to develop out of this training. At, at this beginning stage, we ought to be careful to understand the following truth, that life has been given to us by nature and that this life can be developed by itself in a satisfying way. If we understand this truth, then it will not be very difficult to make the most of our lives, to develop them correctly and to be satisfied from doing so correctly. Most people, however, are not aware of this truth. The majority of people are not interested and so they don't know what life is and they don't know themselves. Instead of taking interest in developing themselves, they just let things happen according to circumstances and situations and what they call luck or fate or fortune. The kind of benefits which are we can reasonably hope for are of two kinds. First, we, it's reasonable to wish for a life that is peaceful and happy. And second, for a kind of life that can be used for the highest benefit. These are the two kind of benefits that it is reasonable to hope for. You should understand that both of these benefits can happen together. There is no contradiction between the two. But unfortunately, a large number of people think that they are two completely separate matters. There are people who think that it's impossible to, to work and be happy at the same time. This is a very sad misunderstanding. It's, if we understand the truth, however, it's easy to find how that in doing our work, in doing our duty, in doing things that are of benefit, we can also be very happy at exactly the same time. And so these two benefits from life can be can work together and help in support each other. This matter we're talking about doesn't really have to be associated with religion or with any specific religion. We can just say that it's something that happens naturally according to natural principles and the law of nature. If, however, any religion is going to be involved in this matter, that's okay if that religion is able to aid us in being successful in realizing these natural benefits of life. However, it's, it's just as easy to say that it all depends on natural laws and then we don't have to 
to make a big issue about this religion or that religion. There are two words that we ought to consider. In the Thai language, they're very, very close. Just one letter is different. The first one is method or witi, and the second one is ceremony or piti. Witi and piti, method and ceremony, are very different, but people tend to mix them up and confuse them. So we should be careful about this because method is scientific and ceremony is superstitious. The way it usually is nowadays is that what we're doing is pretty much just ceremonies. We're turning a lot of things into ceremonies because we tend to attach, we tend to cling to one religion or another. We make too much of a, a big thing. We take our religions too personally. But if we, if we try to base our action on natural law, on natural principles, then it need not be a ceremony and it can become scientific principles when we're not clinging to this or to that, we can, we can live according to scientific methods. If we look around, especially at the modern religions, at current state of religious affairs, we'll see that mostly what's happening is ceremonial. And it's very hard to find any real methods or natural scientific methods being studied and practiced. So please be careful to see the difference and be able to separate the ceremony from the method. And then let's spend our time here looking into scientific methods based on the law of nature. First we'll study these so that we have a thorough understanding. And then of course we must practice that understanding, we must put our understanding into our, our actions in our daily lives. In Thai Buddhism, there's, there's a whole lot more ceremony than there is method. What most of us are doing is just putting on ceremonies and carrying out rituals. It's very difficult to find any genuine use of methods. But the, the intention of Buddhism has never had anything to do with ceremonies. The goal of Buddhism has always been to practice methods that, that actually work. So let's, let's be careful to stick to this original intention. There's no need for the ceremonies. Let's instead really practice the methods that are available to us. It's either strange or sad or pitiful that we intend to practice scientific methods but keep ending up doing ceremonies. We start off with an intention to use methods but end up in our, our rituals. Actually though, all and in all religions, not just Buddha, Buddhism, it's possible to do things in a, in a metho methodological way or in a ceremonial way. And so in most religions, it's pretty much just a bunch of ceremonies. Even in some religions, it's nothing but ceremonies. Although there's always the possibility to do things in a methodical way. So let's, let's try to learn how to do things according to natural laws and do it, use scientific methods. There's a very simple way to distinguish between whether we're doing ceremonies or methods. If we're doing something as a method, a scientific method, 
then we only hope to depend on ourselves. We, we look to ourselves as the one responsible, as the one who is to help us. We help ourselves. However, if we're turning it into ceremonies and rituals, then there's always a wish to depend on someone else or on external things. So it's very simple. Who are we depending on, ourselves or on something else? And in this way we can distinguish ceremonies from methods or separate methods from the ceremonies. A difficulty in this matter is that we instinctually tend to to depend on others, on external things. This is a, a, a basic instinct we have, to be dependent. And so we, it's much easier for us to, to accept ceremonial ways of doing things. We have an affinity for this already. So we need to be very careful to avoid just falling into the instinct our habits and just going along with these instincts. If we're careful, then we can begin to do things methodically rather than ceremonially and learn to depend on ourselves. Otherwise, we just blow hot and cold, go up and down, or are all over, are all over the place, just following our instinctual urges and tendencies. We need to learn to regulate or to have some self-control over our awareness, over our feelings, in order that we can do things as method instead of ceremony. Another thing is that words can often be vague, ambiguous, and uncertain. And so then in religion, if we talk about depending on the highest thing, the supreme thing, no matter what we call it, when we talk about this supreme thing, we can understand it both as something external and something internal. And so we need to be careful to depend on a supreme thing that is within us. For example, in Buddhism, we say that Dhamma, is the highest thing. And Dhamma is something within ourselves. And so we must use this internal Dhamma that we can find within ourselves if our practice is going to be a method. If we want to look at this a bit scientifically, if we talk about Dhamma, we can, especially the Dhamma inside ourselves, then the most scientific way to look at it is that Dhamma is the duty or the function that allows us to survive. The duty, the function that through which we survive, by which we are saved. This is Dhamma. This is the highest thing, duty. And it is something we find inside. You can't find it outside. This is the highest thing, this, this Dhamma. If we, if we don't do it, there's no way that we can survive, and there's no way we can be saved. And if, if we don't do it, there's nothing outside of us, even the highest thing outside of us, any high, supreme, external thing, won't be able to save us if we don't do our duty. But as soon as we do the duty, the necessary function, then that becomes the highest thing, becomes Dhamma, and we can survive, and we are saved. In Buddhism, we hold to a very fundamental principle that if we do not do our duty, all the angels, celestial beings and gods and so on will be powerless to help us. If we don't do our duty, none of these heavenly celestial gods and powers can do anything for us. 
So this is the fundamental meaning of Dhamma that we must go into very carefully in order to see clearly and then from through our personal understanding of it practice it practice it scientifically now we're not talking about these things as Buddhist principles we're not trying to suggest to them or claim them as Buddhists rather we're talking about them as natural principles this duty is a duty according to the law of nature this is all a matter of nature the law of, and the law of nature and our duty according to that law of nature we don't have to to specify any certain religion if we want to call it a religion we could just call it the religion of nature or natural religion the religion of nature the law of nature and the duty that needs to be done in line with the law of nature so it's all very natural we don't have to talk about this religion or that religion we just need to understand these natural principles and live accordingly this whole matter is a matter of nature and when we talk about and Dhamma this Dhamma we're talking about is all a natural matter there are four basic meanings or aspects of the word Dhamma that we'd like to advise you about the first meaning of Dhamma is nature the second is the law of nature the natural law and then third is the duty to be done in line with the law of nature in fourth is the benefit that comes from doing that duty correctly according to natural law these are four meanings the four meanings of Dhamma four natural meanings of Dhamma that we would like to go into in more detail it's just a coincidence that the the central teachings of Buddhism are also based on natural principles are, are that the main teachings of Buddhism are about nature the law of nature the duty to be done in line with natural law and the benefits or the results of doing that duty it's just a coincidence that Buddhism coincides with these natural principles whether we talk about the Four Noble Truths or dependent origination or any of the other central core teachings it's a natural it's a natural matter but so we'd like to go into this further and discuss these various meanings of the word Dhamma these various aspects of nature once we've talked about the general meaning of these wor the meanings of the word Dhamma from to establish a basic understanding then we need to talk about the basic Dhamma that we need to have that we must have in order to realize the purpose of our lives and so when we talk in this aspect of Dhamma we need to talk about three Dhammas which we must have they are Sati mindfulness Panya, wisdom, intuitive wisdom and understanding and Samati, a collected, concentrated, stable mind these are three, three Dhammas we need to have we need to have them not in a ceremonial way but we need to have them in a methodical way the Dhamma that is mindfulness the Dhamma that is intuitive wisdom the Dhamma that is concentration all of these can be talked about on different levels and in great detail but we'd like to express to you in advance that these three Dhammas these three things must be used whenever we meet any external 
or surrounding thing. Whenever we come up against something in the world, in our environment, any, any of the many, many things, we must have mindfulness, sati, intuitive wisdom, panya, and a collected, concentrated mind, samati. Whatever we do, whether we're meeting up with various things in the world, or whether we're enjoying or, or experiencing the results of the work we do in life, or even while studying and investigating this life in which we, that we are leading. All of these three activities, meeting up with, confronting the, the things that surround us in the world, experiencing, experiencing, tasting, consuming, the, the fruits, the benefits that come from our work and our labor, and then our studies and investigations of life. All of these must be done with mindfulness, wisdom, and concentration. If we lack these three dhammas, if these three things are missing, then whenever we meet up with anything from the world around us, then there will be problems, there will be confusion, there will be difficulties, there will be pain and there will be suffering. If we lack mindfulness, wisdom and a collected mind, then whatever we meet up with will lead to, to problems. And those problems, those difficulties will cause us a great deal of harm. We won't know how to respond to them and will behave incorrectly if we lack these three dhammas. In our studies, in our work, in our searching for money, in our getting money, in our having money, in our consumption of things that we receive or that we have around, or in keeping various things that we get. All of these and everything else in our life can only be done successfully if we have these three dhammas of mindfulness, wisdom, and a collected mind. If we lack these three, then whatever it is will turn into a problem, will bring us pain and misery. Today we'll examine these three things carefully and go into as much detail as time will allow us. The first is called sati or intai sati, which is translated usually mindfulness or awareness. This is something we all have naturally, but often it's there's not enough of it or it's too slow. In life, we, the mind is constantly experiencing various stimuli coming in through all the various senses. And usually mindfulness is, is too slow to be there at the time the mind makes contact, the time the mind experiences something. Sati is for the mind to recollect, to reflect, to come, to be right there at the point of experience, to be aware, to be fully aware there at the moment of experience. The mind to come back to that, to be right there. But so often our mindfulness is not well enough developed. It's too slow, it's too clumsy, it's too weak. And so we need to develop it. We need to train it. Our natural level of mindfulness is okay for getting through life, but it's not enough for ourselves to really live life as we should. And so we must train it. We must develop it in a proper way. Siddhi always operates with panya, intuitive wisdom. It's 
pointless to talk about one without the other. They always work together. Sati, mindfulness, is like the transport mechanism or the vehicle for wisdom. Whenever anything confronts the mind, Sati, mindfulness, recollects wisdom. Sati is recollection. Sati recollects wisdom. It goes and gets wisdom and brings it right here, right at the moment of experiencing whatever it is. Sati brings wisdom, brings correct knowledge right there to deal with the specific thing occurring right at this moment. If sati is too slow, then wisdom doesn't come. So we must have sati and wisdom. Without sati, there's no wisdom to solve the problem. Sati, mindfulness alone, cannot solve the problem, cannot deal with the situation properly. It must bring wisdom, correct knowledge and understanding right there on time to deal with the situation. This is how these two work together, sati and panya. It's just as if we had a very powerful weapon, but without sati, we can't bring the weapon into play and so it's useless. But if we have sufficient, strong enough, quick enough mindfulness, then it can recollect the weapon and then bring the weapon into action in order to deal with the situation. Sati mindfulness is an immediate awareness, an instantaneous awareness of this situation of whatever is happening with the mind, for the mind, in the mind. And then when there is this sati quick enough, right on time, then it can recollect, it can, it can retrieve wisdom. Now sati must be able to select the correct wisdom, the appropriate wisdom for the specific situation. Wisdom is very broad. It can, includes knowledge of many things from various angles. Sati must choose just the, the right wisdom to bring to the situation in order to deal specifically with, with what's taking place. So mindfulness must be instantaneous, immediate. It must be very quick. It must be able to recollect wisdom and choose the proper wisdom, then that sati is correct. It must be fast, it must be correct, able to bring, retrieve the correct wisdom needed for the situation. Then mindfulness and wisdom can work properly in order to deal successfully with, ever, with whatever is happening. Mindfulness can also protect against and prevent problems. We've just talked about how mindfulness retrieves wisdom in order to solve or correct problems. But mindfulness can also prevent them. And of course it's better, better to prevent any difficulties than to have to solve them once they've occurred. If we if we know how to use mindfulness properly, if we've trained it enough, then it is able to come in and prevent the arising of any misunderstanding, any foolish responses, any blind reactions. It won't allow anything evil or harmful or dangerous to arise if we know how to use it correctly. By practicing anapanasati, pavana, the mental, mental development through using mindfulness with breathing in and out, this will train mindfulness so that it is very fast and correct, so that we can use it to prevent all problems. Or if we slip 
<coughs> then we'll be able to use mindfulness to to help solve any problems that might have occurred. Now we come to the second <coughs> of these dhammas, panya, wisdom or intuitive wisdom, co correct understanding. There are many, many things that we could know, that it is possible to know. But panya, wisdom, is specifically the things we need to know. All the things that we could know are far too much for us to fully understand. But what we need to know is, is limited enough that all of us are capable of understanding it thoroughly. In short, the thing we need to know is how suffering arises, how mental anguish arises, and how suffering ceases. If we under, to understand these two aspects of nature is wisdom. We can compare it to a fist, a handful of leaves. You don't have to pick up all the leaves in the forest. That would be impossible. But if you can, if you can pick up just this one handful of leaves, then it will be enough to solve all your problems and then even better to prevent any new problems. This knowledge we've just mentioned is truth. We call it the truth. Now this, this kind of knowledge, this truth that we're talking about must be correct. It must be right. There's a lot of knowledge around that is incorrect or, or useless. It doesn't serve any benefit. For knowledge to be wisdom, it must be correct. And by correct, that means it has to be able to solve the, the problem of suffering. There's this very deep and profound experience troubling us, and we call it suffering. If knowledge is correct, it must be able to understand and solve this problem then it can be called wisdom or correct knowledge, correct understanding. In the Buddha's language, he used the word sama, sama, which means correct, right. If it's not right, then it doesn't do us any good, and it's not really true. It may seem true, but to be true, it must help us to deal with the fundamental problem of our lives. Then it's right knowledge then it's wisdom. Whether it's we're talking about the Four Noble Truths or dependent origination, this, this is the heart of wisdom because this deals with this, the, the reality of this suffering, how it arises and how it ceases. And that's all we need to know. Having this correct wisdom Having, understanding this truth correctly has the highest benefit. It is tremendously beneficial for our lives because when we have this wisdom, then we will never again become slaves to the things we call good and bad. Without this wisdom, we're always getting stuck to, getting trapped by, cornered by, and led around by what we call good and what we call bad. Good and bad is the, the original duality. It's the, the basic duality from which all the other dualisms spring. If we have this wisdom we're talking about, then none of these good and evil and none of the other dualisms, any pairs of opposites, will have any power over our minds. And then we will be free. The mind will be liberated. It will be freed from everything that is disturbing it. This is the tremendous benefit that comes from, from developing this correct wisdom. For those of you who are Christian, please, please think back to 
the, a place in the first chapter of Genesis, way back at the beginning of the Bible. There's one, one single sentence where God gives a very direct teaching or commandment to Adam and Eve. In one sentence, God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't eat that fruit that will lead to the knowledge about good and evil. This first commandment, the first time that God spoke directly to, to man, is exactly the same as the fundamental understanding of Buddhism. Do not fall under the influence or the power of good and evil. As soon as we become influenced by good and evil, we get trapped and it brings suffering. Unfortunately, Christians aren't interested in this first commandment of God. They show much more interest in the words of Jesus Christ, which are, are of a lesser or lower un nature or importance. We ask that you spe give special attention, though, to this first commandment of God, because this is the, the pinnacle of wisdom. This, this, this one sentence expresses the supreme wisdom. As soon as we get trapped by good and evil, as soon as we cling to it, as soon as we believe that this is good and that is evil, then we're trapped. We get locked up in a prison of suffering. If we understand what God commanded and practice accordingly, then we will be freed. And so please give this careful attention, especially if those of you who consider yourself Christians. When we have developed, collected, gathered enough understanding, enough wisdom, it's like we we store up wisdom. When we've stored up sufficient wisdom of genuine, co correct understanding, then sati, mindfulness, can retrieve that wisdom to be used in specific circumstances as is needed. Sati comes and gets the, the right amount or the right kind of wisdom to, to deal with whatever situation is happening. So sati and panya, wisdom, work together like this. Now, wisdom is very, is, wisdom means the entire collection of our understanding, which is much more than ever needs to be used in one specific situation. The specific aspect or the specific knowledge that is retrieved by mindfulness and then applied to a specific situation, a specific event or experience within the mind. That specific wisdom we call sampajanya. We can call it, sometimes it's called clear comprehension, meaning to fully understand the exact situation here. Or we can call it wisdom in action or applied wisdom. So there's mindfulness, there's our collect, collected wisdom, and then there's the, the application to a specific situation of that wisdom which we call Sampajanya. Sampajanya is a word derived from the word Panya, wisdom, and it means applied wisdom, wisdom in action. We should understand how this works in order that we can derive the fullest benefits from this natural principle about the mind. Now we come to the third Dhamma, which is Samadhi. Samadhi. This is often translated concentration, but be very, very careful to listen to the explanation. It can also be translated collectiveness. This is something, collectedness, 
This is something that exists naturally. It's instinctive in all, all sentient beings. You can see this, that as soon as we, in, as soon as we intend to do anything, the mind will have a degree of concentration on doing that thing, say to, to shoot a gun or to pick up a stone and throw it or even brush our teeth. There will be a degree of naturally arising concentration involved. But this instinctual samadhi is not enough. It's not strong enough. So we need to train and develop it further. Samadhi is a gathering, a collecting together of the mind's power, of the mind's energy. As it's collected, then it can be focused into doing any activity. The more the mind is gathered together, is collected together, the more prepared it is, the more ready it is to do any kind of work. So the concentration we're talking about here is not a a dull, sleepy state, but it's a very active, very ready mind. It's also very solid and stable because, and very powerful because of all that mental energy gathered together. When there is samadhi, then this great power can be used to support wisdom. When there's adequate samadhi, then wisdom can operate very efficiently and very quickly very effectively deal with any situation. So we have samadhi in order that wisdom can do its work. We train and develop the mind's ability to gather itself together, to collect up its power so that it's very active and completely ready to to do anything. So whether we use this through training the mind properly, the mind will always have samadhi, whether to support wisdom as wisdom performs its duty, or just for the the mind all by itself to have a level of alertness, activeness, and strength. This is the role of samadhi. Another advantage of Samadhi is that it can bring instant happiness. It can bring immediate happiness. Whenever you're feeling unhappy, whenever you need some joy, then just make the mind, bring the mind into a state of samadhi, and then there will be joy. Just by using, use samadhi to clear the mind of any harmful or foul moods or emotions or feelings, just chase them away, chase any bad or evil thoughts away. Any thoughts, any moods, any emotions that are causing us pain or suffering can be chased away by samadhi and then there will be instant joy. This joy is another advantage of samadhi and we can learn to do this whenever we need to. This this joy, this happiness is very useful. It can be an aid to the development of wisdom. Once there is a a calm joy in the mind, it will support our, our development of wisdom. And then as wisdom grows, we are more and more able to solve all the problems of life. So please understand how these three dhammas work. If we, if we learn to develop them, train them correctly, then they will be able to, to solve any difficulties that occur in our lives. So sati, mindfulness, panya, wisdom, and samati, collectedness of mind. All three of these together can, can work together. They form a team. And if we allow them to work together as a team to the best of their ability, then our life will be free of all problems.
So these three things are sati, panya, and samadhi, mindfulness, intuitive wisdom, and concentration. If you can develop all three of these until they are full, complete, and perfect, then your life will experience no pain and no problem. You can develop all three of these fully through my practicing mindfulness with breathing in and breathing out. If you practice anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, successfully and completely, then mindfulness, wisdom, and samadhi will be full, complete, and perfect. Through practicing mindfulness and breathing, let us, let us insist or, or declare or assure you that through correctly and successfully and fully practicing mindfulness with breathing, you will then have all three of these dhammas to aid you in life, and they will be able to solve all problems. So we hope that you will can come to understand how this works and then apply yourselves to it diligently. And we we hope very much that you will be completely ses- successful in this endeavor, that you will have all the mindfulness, wisdom, and concentration that you need to live a completely peaceful and useful life. We wish you the greatest success and request now that today's talk be finished. <laughs>